Welcome to you who are online joining us. We're glad you're with us. Somewhere in the universe, in the chat universe, you'll find some notes. And there's notes here if you need some or you can just go on your phone. Download them right now. We do have copies in the back for you. And also a handout. If you haven't grabbed one of these on your way out, this is a reminder of the I am's that are in the book of John. And so this might be helpful for you to remind yourself of these statements there. Some po- Excuse me, something that you could uh, take with you, put on your mirror, uh, put wherever that reminds you of these great truths that are found in this gospel. Okay, Pew Bible, 758. This is where we are this morning, 758. <laughs> and we are in John chapter 8, where we are looking to finish up this now heated conversation between Jesus and the leading religious rulers. If you remember, if you've been with us, here's Jesus. He is uh, proclaiming who he is at the temple, temple in Jerusalem during a festival. And this dialogue, this conversation is going, going, going. And at this point, there has been accusations being leveled on both sides. And they have to do, do with who indeed is Jesus, his identity, And the Pharisees and who they think they are and who their father is. Is it Abraham or someone else? And this conversation is going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It is worth reading and reading again. It is worth taking your time in comprehending the argumentation and the claims that are being made. And there is significant and strong truth. Now, in the book of John, I've mentioned this many times before. If you can put those verses up on the screen, this is John 20, 31. When you read the book of John, in particular, I want you to identify and look to this verse. This is the reason why John wrote these things. Let's just say this together. Let's just read it aloud together. So here we go. John 20, 31. These are written so that you may believe. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So this is John's point of this whole book, guided by the Holy Spirit. And so when you read the book of John especially, you have to ask yourself a question. What about this passage points to the identity of Jesus Christ. What about this story brings to mind who Jesus is so that we can know more than just facts and argumentation and individual things that happen, but that we would recognize by the power of the Holy Spirit Jesus' true identity and then therefore put our life in his hands, give ourselves over to him in belief of what he said, that he will forgive us of our trespasses or sin, that he will renew us by his Holy Spirit, empower us to follow and live for him and in him, and by believing in Jesus the Christ, you and I may have Life in his name. So that is the glasses or the lenses in which we are reading these passages and asking ourselves, what about this, again, points me to Christ. And our passage this morning is no different than that. Okay, so here we are. John chapter 8, and we're going to pick up this conversation in verse 48, okay? They're going back and forth. They're making accusations. And then um, Jesus is asked two questions in this passage. So this whole message is around two questions, and there's some sub sub points. So there's a lot going on here, but just two questions, okay? So this is, again, picture in your mind the scene. Probably hundreds, if not thousands of people around. Jesus more than likely up on the steps, sitting down. People are gathered, and there's conversation and dialogue going on. And Jesus is claiming he's the light of the world. Jesus is claiming, hey, come to me, you who thirst. And he's claiming all of these astounding, amazing um, things. And so they're 
hearing this and are like, whoa, wait a second. What you're claiming then is you're claiming divinity. And they're going back and forth and back and forth. Okay, So at this point, this is the question or the conclusion that they drew. Okay, And so this is John chapter 8, uh, starting with verse 48. So the Jews answered him. Okay, After hearing all this, they're saying, aren't we right in saying... That you are a Samaritan and are demon-possessed, okay? Whoa, right? So they're saying you are a, a demon-possessed half-breed, right? This is what they're saying to Jesus. Jesus, aren't we right? Because we've heard you and obviously your theology is horrible. And what you're doing we see, but it doesn't come from you because mm, we don't believe you. You know what? Not only do we not believe you... You're demon-possessed, right? Now, if there's anyone on this entire planet that's not demon-possessed, it's Jesus, okay? How do you get it that wrong, right? They were so blinded, right? These are people who claimed to know God. And here is the very Word of God embodied in the Son of God standing in front of them, and they couldn't see who He is. This is hardness of heart to the nth degree. By the way, this continues even to this day, where we have religious leaders all over the place saying that Jesus was a moral man or a good teacher, but they don't even recognize who he really is. The Son of God who came into the world to take away the sins of the world. He wasn't trying out to be God. He was God, right? And he claimed this. And these guys were like, nah, we ain't going to have none of that, Jesus. Obviously, you're a half-breed, demon-possessed person, right? Shooting at a target, but in the exact 100%, 180-degree different direction, right? So how is Jesus going to respond to this, right? So this is, so he says, Jesus, are you a Samaritan demon possessed? Here's how Jesus responds in verse 49a. He says, mm, I'm not demon possessed. I am not possessed by a demon, demon, said Jesus. So this is our first sub point. I am not possessed by a demon. Jesus emphatically denies the charge. <laughs> there again is no way that he is empowered or possessed or oppressed by a demon. By the way, demons are still active and alive today. I'm just throwing this in. Not that we're looking for a demon behind every doorknob, but they are working. Well, certainly they're working in Washington, D.C. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Oh, that's in Africa. Fooey, they're here. Working. They work behind the scenes, yo, right? I have seen some stuff, right? And so they were aware that there are supernatural prince of palates. There's angels that are here. There's angels even among us here. And there's also supernatural, demonic, devil-inspired workers happening. There is a clash even in the heavenlies. There's a clash even in this place. They are out to kill, steal, and destroy and to pervert what is good and make it evil. This is how they're working. And Jesus says, listen to me, guys. I am not demon-possessed, right? Emphatically. So they knew that he had power, and it was supernatural power, but they got the wrong source, okay? This is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, by the way, okay? And this was problematic. And Jesus says, no, I'm not possessed by a demon. And no, he didn't even dress the Samaritan thing because they could have figured out exactly where he was from, right? He wasn't a half-breed, so to speak. However, he was fully man and he was fully God, but he wasn't a Samaritan. If you don't under know what Samaritan is, you got to go read it. I don't got time, okay? Half-breeds. <laughs> but this was a pretty nasty charge. It doesn't get... You kind of get harder than this. You're demon-possessed, right? Like, whoa, right? You're a half-breed, no-good, backwater person, all right? 
And so he says, I'm not demon-possessed. Now he continues to go on refuting this question or this charge. Verse 49, second part of that verse. But I honor my father. This is 49b. But I, I'm not demon-possessed, but I honor my father. <laughs> and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself. But there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Okay, what was he saying here? He says, I'm honoring my father. The guy you claim is your father. Mm -mm. He's my father, and what I do is honoring him. And by the way, not only am I living to honor my father, but he seeks my glory. Right? That's the statement, right? He's saying, hey, listen, I'm living, I am honoring, my whole goal is to honor God. And by the way, his desire is to bring glory to me. Right? These guys thought that they were the keepers of the glory of God in the Ark of the Covenant. Right? They thought the glory was back in a dark room, but the glory was standing in front of them. Right? I am living to honor my Father. Do you believe that Jesus indeed is the Word incarnate? As we see Jesus, we see the Father. And this is what he is saying. I am honoring my Father. Father, everything I do. If you want to understand God, the Father, you look at God, the Son, and you see his heart. You see him interacting. You see him engaging with his creation in a most profound and powerful way. Jesus lived to honor the Father. He wasn't even looking for his own glory. He wasn't saying, yeah, you better bow down, y'all. He was saying, I live for God, and God says, because you live for me, I look to give you honor. This is a significant rebuttal of these people laying this judgment on him. Oh, and by the way, this is really interesting. For there's one who seeks it, and he is the judge, okay? Why did he bring this up right here? Well, they thought that their word was authoritative, and he says, ah, listen to me, listen to me. The one who is seeking my, my, my glory, he's the judge. His word is law. His word is final, and who he says I am is who I am doesn't matter what other people say about Jesus. It doesn't change who he is, right? You and I don't get to vote on who Jesus is. And like, you know, the highest percentage, that's who he is. Hey, no. He's the son of God because he is called it by God, his father. Granted, there is a trinity. Granted, he's a part of this. But he's saying, the final word isn't yours. It isn't mine. It isn't other religious leaders. It is God, the Father himself. And he is the judge. His word matters. Now, check out what Jesus did then next. He says, hey, truly, truly, very truly, hey, pay attention to this. I'm telling you, Jesus was saying, whoever obeys my word will never see death, right? So here are these people like, yeah, yeah, you're demon-possessed. He's like, mm, no, I'm not. I'm living for my father. Oh, and he's the judge. And oh, by the way, whoever obeys my word will never see or taste death, right? He's not just backing up in the corner like, don't hit me. He is coming out swinging. He's like, Okay, all right, you're going to say that? Mm. If you want to live eternally, you must obey what I say. Right? This is a huge statement. Don't let it pass you by. What Jesus was offering was eternal life. By the way, anyone here ever heard of the fountain of youth? Right? 
this mystical place in which people have sought out from ages in the past. Like all people, I would say not every person, but people everywhere want to deal with an issue called mortality, right? The expiration date stamped on our bodies, right? We all have one. And so this is a problem that every person everywhere faces. And here is Jesus stepping into the darkness and saying, hey, if you listen to me, if you obey me, if you believe me, you will never see death. So he says, I'm offering whoever obeys my word never to see death. Now, we have to notice that this is a conditional promise. If, then. Whoever obeys, if my word, then will never see death. To obey his word, that means to hang on to, right? We've talked about this. Retain, keep, follow, have it imprinted or tattooed on your soul that you Take, see it as holy, you see it as pr precious, you see it as right. And it is to believe first and follow second. Did you catch that? He commands us to what? Love the Lord our God, right? You remember this? With all our mind, soul, heart, and strength. Love, believe, cherish, honor. Second is like it. What is it? To love your neighbor as yourself. It is loving God first and foremost, above all things, because his name is above all things. He is holy, he is God, he is our creator, he is our friend, he is just, he is our judge. And that is the first, to love him, to believe, love our neighbor as ourselves, to live out his words, to hang on, retain, keep, follow the folks who believe in Jesus will never see death. But you're going to say, like, hold the phone, bro. People die, right? Even if those who believe in Jesus die, everything on this planet eventually dies. It has life from microbes to plants to animals to people. So when Jesus said, those who believe in me will never see death, what is he talking about? Right? So in a few chapters, in chapter 11, I'm just bringing this back into this. Rick's going to preach it in a number of weeks, okay? Jesus said these helpful words to a grieving lady named Martha on the death of her beloved brother Lazarus. And we're going to read it in a couple weeks, or excuse me, probably, well, I don't know, a number of weeks, we'll get there, okay? John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus addresses this this way. He says, Jesus said to her, this grieving woman, he says, I am, check that, the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he or she dies, yet shall he or she live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So Jesus said, even though we die, we will live or be alive, right? And Jesus, by the way, already said this in the book of John. You can go back to John chapter 5. Okay, I'm going to bring this back to us to remind us. John chapter 5, verse 24. Jesus again said, truly, truly, or barely, very, hey, pay attention. He says, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes, okay, believes is important. Him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. That means all of us here are in death. Do you know that? We all have been given a death sentence, right? Well, I'm not in a cell somewhere waiting for some injection. Yeah, <laughs> but you're dying. Look at me, I'm strong. You are now. 
wait about 60 years. When we die, we don't go from living to being dead. We go from dead to be alive, right? Those who are no longer in their physical body are more alive than any of us in this room right now. The day is coming in which there will be a resurrection of these bodies and will be connected again that way, but they are not dead. Why do I say that? Because Jesus says it. Are you going to trust Jesus and his word? Yes. I hope you do. By the way, he's not looking for your opinion, nor is he looking for your approval. He is staking, he is saying the plain truth, right? All who believe in me have eternal life. It is a present tense reality with a future tense fulfillment. It's like a down payment of what's to come, right? Guaranteeing, and this is because of what Christ said in believing in him. And so when Jesus said this statement, hey, whoever obeys my word, keeps my word, loves me, believes in me, looks to follow me, they will never see death. What he was talking about, by the way, is something called the second death. Now, if you're not familiar with this, you can go to Revelation. I put the passages here in your notes. It's Jesus talking to the author of this gospel, John, who was now at the end of his life. He was um, exiled because he was Um, converting people to Christianity, and Jesus himself spoke to him while he was on this island called Patmos, and he wrote down the book of Revelation. Now, in that book, Jesus then talks about the second death, the eternal death, and there is death that leads to eternal, eternal death, and there is death that leads to eternal life. If you believe in Jesus and keep his word, you will not see the second death. Revelation 2.11, it's there, Revelation 26, Revelation 20.14, Revelation 21.8, talking about the second death. So you may die, and the chances are good that we will all die unless Jesus comes. Well, the chances are 100% we're all going to die. I'll just put it that way, right? Unless we're raptured, right? That's a death, but it's not the second death, which means if you read about this, a turning over and turning in to a lake of fire called the second death. So what Jesus is saying is not, well, believe in me and you will never physically die. He's not saying that. He says, listen, if you believe in me, you have life eternal. Even after you die, you will live. Do you understand how significant that phrase is? Right? What other religious leader made that assertion, made that offer? Jesus did. And Jesus proved who he was by what he did, what he said, and God the Father said, After he was crucified, let's go, son. Rose again. Life eternal. And if we die in him, my friends, we will be raised in him. You either believe it or you don't. Jesus was lying or he was telling the truth. You have to decide. And if he was lying, then disregard him but if he's telling the truth you better pay attention because what he claimed is earth shattering eternity eternity changing life itself and he makes claim after claim after claim and he was claiming the power to give eternal life which only God has. He was claiming by saying this that he indeed is divinity. Indeed, God. 
So let's recap this question, okay? He says, I'm not possessed by a demon, right? You're a Samaritan, you're demon possessed. He says, I'm not possessed by a demon. I'm honoring my father. My father seeks my glory. And I'm offering whoever obeys my word never to see death. Now, this is how these people responded in verse 52. At this, they exclaimed, <laughs> Now we know you're demon possessed. Abraham died, so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. You think you're greater than our father Abraham? He died, so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Right? Can you hear the tone of voice? Right? Right? Who do you think you are? Right? They were offended. They were put off. They were like, what are you talking about? Not comprehending what he was saying. So this is our second question. Jesus, who do you think you are? It is point blank asked of him. And Jesus had been revealing himself all the way along, but they did not believe. They looked to discredit him. <clears throat> and this is what he says. Jesus replied, verse 54. This is important. All of this is important. This is what he says. Now, if I glorify myself, right, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God... He is the one who brings me glory, okay? This is the first statement. I am the one who my Father glorifies, right? He's repeating it again, saying again he was not trying to glorify himself because they wouldn't accept his testimony. He could say, well, I am God, right? They wouldn't accept it. So he says, you know what? My Father says who I am. The one that you claim is God is the one who glorifies me. And Christ, throughout the Gospels, was glorified at his baptism by what? The voice of his Father. This is my Son, whom I love. Listen to him. Jesus was glorified when he prayed to his Father. Father, will you multiply this bread and these fishes to these people. Jesus was glorified by the power and the presence of God when he opened blind eyes, when he raised people from the dead. Jesus was glorified by his Father in what is called the Mount of Transfiguration, where he was there on the mountain and Elijah was here. And Moses was there, and he was dazzling, glorified. He was glorified in the power of the resurrection. So when they asked him, who do you think you are? He said, let me tell you, number one, I'm the one in whom the Father glorifies. Verse 55. Now, though you do not know him, I know him. And if I said I did not, <laughs> check this out, I'd be a liar like you. Right? He says, but I know him. Right? So Jesus says, I am the one who knows the Father. So I am the one that the Father is looking to glorify. I am the one who knows the Father. Knows the Father. This is knowing his mind, knowing his heart, knowing his weight. This is knowledge gained through connection and intimacy. God the Father is a known quantity to Jesus. He's not getting to know him. He's not seeking to know him. He's not hoping to know him. He knows him. Like no one ever has nor ever will. This is a significant claim. These men who had studied the scriptures thought that they knew him, but they did not. They were liars. Right? He says, you want to know who I am? I know the Father. Right? 
You do not, but I know him. Significant claim. And not only does he say this and he couples it with this next part, and I obey his word. I'm the one who obeys the Father. I'm the one who knows the Father. I'm the one who obeys the Father. So Jesus was telling them, you guys claim falsely that you are the sons of Abraham. I want you to know (laughs) that I obey his word. I jumped ahead, but I want you to know the one who obeys the Father is me. He did not just know God, but prefer, perfectly fulfilled the word and the will of his Father. Jesus was God. Okay, I want to get this, right? But he obeyed God's word, obeyed God's will. So when you see Jesus, again, you saw the heart of the Father. And what he was doing was obedience to the word of his Father. He knows him. He follows him. He obeys him truly, fully, And completely. Unlike the people who just had, you know, had the written word but didn't have the heart of God. They saw his word but they didn't see him. Religious hypocrites. No one who lives today is a religious hypocrite. God, help us. <laughs> Jesus is saying, listen, the Father glorifies me. Listen, I know him. Listen, not only do I know him, I obey him. Fulfill what his desires are. <laughs> Verse 56. This is now, they're getting to this point of Abraham. You can track the argumentation. If you haven't been with us, just read chapter 8. You'll see this coming up. Jesus says back to them, hmm, by the way, your father Abraham right, rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. <laughs> Abraham saw it and he was glad. Right? I am the one who make, made Abraham rejoice. Now, Abraham was the person they were putting all their chips on, right? I'm going with Abraham, La Moses, Abraham's our guy, right? And they argued about, well, who was indeed a child of God, okay? That was last week. And they say, listen, Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. Abraham, as you read in Genesis chapter 12 and following up to 18, where God sought out a man and he spoke to him promises, follow me. And from you I will bless all the nations. And from you there will be kings. And from you there will be a king of all kings. The one singular, the promise singular. There's a child of promise named um, uh, Isaac, promise, and Abraham believed that promise, but it was deposit on the one who was eventually going to come, and Jesus says, I'm that one. Abraham was glad in receiving what God give him, gave him that day. And the promises of blessing trickled down to generations and nations. But you know what made Abraham the, the gladdest? The one in which he rejoiced it wasn't his son, promised son Isaac, but it was the promised son, Jesus Abraham was telling him, hey, listen, listen, listen. Abraham, your man, I want to let you know who I am. (laughs) I'm the one, when he saw my day, he was happy. Rejoicing in that day. (laughs) Now, these guys hearing him, like, this was mind-blowing to them. Verse 57, they said to him, dude, you're not yet 50. 
That's a paraphrase, by the way. And you've seen Abraham? What are you talking about, Jesus? And here's Jesus standing up in his glory. He says, listen to me. Before Abraham was born, I am. I just got chills. Now these people knew exactly what he was saying. They were saying, wait, 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 wait a second. You don't know Abraham, you're not old enough. Jesus stands up and says, you know what? Before Abraham was, and by the way, he didn't answer it this way. He could have said, before Abraham was, I was. Okay. Saying that he's preexistent than Abraham. Saying that, you know, I'm super old, dudes. No, he, wasn't, he didn't say that. No, what he said, he used the exact language that God the Father, in revealing who he was to a guy named Moses in a bush that was burning, it was on fire, but it wasn't burning. When Moses was there and he asked, who is this? God the Father said, I am who I am. And so Jesus, in this passage, when they ask him, who do you think you are? His answer is, I am. That's what he was saying. He was saying all along who he was. And he said right here, I am who I am. I am God. Right? He claimed his divinity clearly, straightforwardly. Removing any shadow of doubt that these people were wondering as they missed it continually. He says he's God. And if every, anyone ever tells you that Jesus never claimed divinity, show them this passage. What are you talking about? I've heard this and it's ridiculous. Read your Bible. He says, I am who I am. Before Abraham was born, I am. Mic drop. Right? Now, this wasn't lost on the Jews. <laughs> They're like, mm, now we got gotcha. you. Verse 59, at this, they picked up stones to stone him, to kill him. Why that response? Well, they knew the Old Testament passage, and they saw this as blasphemy, saying something about yourself, claiming something for yourself that was only God's. As they are, by the way, were waiting for the Messiah to show up, right? They knew exactly what he said, so they're like, mm, time to die, right? And they started gathering stones, however many people were there, right? Those who didn't believe. They picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, right? slipping away from the temple grounds. Right? It wasn't yet time for him to die. Right? There was a certain mission and a certain way it was going to happen, and it wasn't going to happen right then in that way, even though they understood clearly his claims, but they did not believe. Do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus is the great I am? If you believe, it matters. Right? What he says matters. What he claims matters. What he promises matters. His word matters. I have a hard time with people who claim to follow Jesus but don't really pay attention to what he said. 
Are you a believer? Or are you a cultural Christian? How many people, okay, here I go, soapbox time. <laughs> but I'm preaching, right? Mm. We do surveys in this, and I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to be real, right? We do surveys in this country. What religion are you, right? How, you know how many Americans say that they're Christians? Around 87%. Some say 80, it's in the 80s. If you ask these same people, and Barna has done this, and say, hey, what's the gospel all about? You think 80% could say what the gospel is? Hey, when's the last time you read your Bible? God so loved the world that he gave his only son good to know. Do you cherish his word? Do you follow him? Do you believe that he is the son of God? If you believe, it matters. This is what he was saying. Right? He said he was the I am. He said he was the light of the world. He said anyone who believes in him will never perish but receive eternal life. He says he is the resurrection and the life. He says he is the way, the truth, and the life. He says he is the gate, he is the shepherd, he is the... Behind this, or just in John, he matters. Jesus, who do you think you are? I am the one whom my Father glorifies. I am the one who knows the Father. I am the one who obeys the Father. I am the one who made Abraham rejoice. I am who I am. And if you believe him and obey his word, you will never see death. That's good news. Right? <laughs> By believing, you will have a life in his name. So believers, believe him. Love my goal is for you, and most of us in this room are believers, that you will love him more, that you would honor him more, that you will follow him more, and worship him greater, for he is the great I am. If you're on the fence, make your choice. As for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord and dwell in his house how long? You know the verse. So, Father, here we are, gathered together, seeing what you, Jesus, proclaimed about yourself. It is powerful. It is profound. It is eternity-altering. God, you know I've prayed this for us, this congregation, God, that we would love you, we would believe in you, that we would cherish you, we would honor your word, we'd be people of prayer, people of the word, people who love God and who love each other well. And God, you know we stumble at this. We need your help to empower us, I ask. Empower those listening, we ask. That the truth of what you claimed, what you proclaimed, what you promised, would be in us, God. That we would be and remain in your hand. We would be and remain agents of the light. We would 
enjoy being sons and daughters, commune with you, know you, and honor you. We cry with the angels, holy, holy, holy. We'll be holy forever. We praise you and give you praise in Jesus' name.